Well, welcome everyone to uh, today's presentation, Strategies for a Successful Search, Process of Creating and Applying for an Archival Position. Our presenters today are uh, Carly Lowe, University Archivist. Carly, um, her work focuses on studying and developing practices that shift collection uh, strategies, expand archival audiences, and improve the sustainability of archival institutions with the goal of ensuring that archives are relevant to present needs and prepared for future challenges. I think Carly's going to talk to us a little more about the side of the presentation that has to do with applying for an archival position, but we'll wait and see. And then our other presenter is Craig Simpson. And uh, Craig is the Director of Special Collections and Archives at San Jose State University. Uh, and uh, he is co-author of Above the Shots, an oral history of the Kent State shootings Kent State University Press and a contributing author to Orson Welles in Focus, Texts and Context, Indiana University Press. And Craig has worked in the archival profession for 16 years and been a certified archivist for 11 of those years. And I'm going to turn the presentation right over to Craig so he could get us started. Great. Thank you, Pat. Thanks everyone for, uh, <laughs> thank you, Carly, <laughs> uh, for, for coming to this. And uh, so when, when Carly and I were, were trying to decide on a, on a webinar when, when Pat very kindly invited us to host one, we, we decided on this particular topic because we were, we were each on opposite sides of the university archivist search that uh, started about a year and a half, almost two years ago. And uh, myself being the chair of the recruitment committee and Carly, of course, being ultimately the, the, the final candidate who got the job. And, um, you know, we thought that the, the outcomes that we, that we hope to provide in this hour that we're gonna be together is to hopefully demystify the process because we know, uh, like, like Pat said, I've been in the profession for, for about 16 years now. I have applied for many jobs and I have also been on the other side on, on many committees. And, you know, searches perhaps now more than ever are a very uh, arduous, stressful process. And um, so I think what we, what we hope to do is by, you know, providing both sides of this is to just kind of take you through exactly um, not all of the inside baseball, but just kind of some of the basic key steps that happen in creating a position and conducting a search um, that will be at my end of this talk. And then for Carly's end, as, as Pat indicated, she'll talk about her, pro her own individual process in, in applying for the position and um, going through the steps of the interview and so forth. So as, as you all know, there are all kinds of jobs in the archival profession. And really at the most elemental level, you can boil it down to two kinds. There, there are either existing positions that need to be filled, or there are new positions that have been created. And when you look at job postings, just like this random example on the, on the right side of my screen that I, I snipped from the SAA Job Center last week. Uh, it, most of the time, it's very hard to tell which is which. I mean, it's fairly, if you see a dean position, probably safe to assume that was an existing position. But a lot of other things, um, it, it can be really hard to tell. And it, occasionally a job description may tell you it's a new position, um, but by and large, by and large, you don't know. Um, so in the case of the university archivist position, this was actually a new position that had been created. And I should tell you that uh, a new full-time tenure track position it, it has to go through 
you have to jump through a lot of hoops um, before it becomes a reality. Although ironically, one thing, one thing that I've learned um, over the years is that it's actually, it's actually easier to create a new full-time tenure track position than it is to take an already existing position that is not tenure track uh, and then try to turn that into a position. Um, one, of the, one of the hard facts of the profession, and I think it's true of any profession, is that you know, from, from the administrative side, they're often looking at, they're, they're really looking at positions and not necessarily people. And that's, that's, that's kind of a harsh reality. And I think it's, it is unfair in a lot of ways, but that is, that is the nature of the beast. And so I think it's, it's important to, to realize that uh, when you're going in and applying for jobs. So when you, when you're creating a new full-time position, you, you have to, it, it has to go do a couple of big things. Number one is it has to address a need and you have to show that it's addressing a need uh, in your particular unit, in your library, on your campus that uh, at the moment is not present. It also has to have the support of key administrators. So you know, your dean and the provost are two are two of your key potential stakeholders. Um, obviously, if there are if you can get enthusiasm from from important donors, uh, that's also something because I I know that when I mentioned this to donors when I started, there was there was a great deal of enthusiasm and support from them for this job. And just bear in mind also, it, it has to go through several stages before being posted. You know, budgets for universities uh, at, the, at the broad level and libraries at the more specific level, they're, they are thought out very well in advance. So, um, and I'll take you through the very, uh, a, a process that was long but in, in some respects, it was relatively fast compared to what I've seen with, with other positions in the profession. In the case of SJSU, it, it helped when I got here to get a sense of the context of the history of the university itself and the university archives in particular, as I think Many of you know, uh, SJSU was founded in 1857. It's over 160 years old. It is a very old, uh, rich historical institution with a lot of um, a lot of significance that all those indicators suggest. So, there was um, on that particular foundation, it was uh, it was easier to make the case for this position than it, it otherwise would have. Because even though we have this, this long, rich history, and even though we have had a, a university archives, and, and we've had archivists in the past as well, too. Um, when I started, well, I guess maybe to back up a bit, because Carly reminded me yesterday, we had uh, uh, Brett. Brett Melendi, if I'm pronouncing his name right, many years ago, who, who, who called himself the the university archivist, and whose collection we now we now have. It's an excellent collection of materials. Uh, and then when I started, I had a a, a part time archivist was was her position. Uh, she was working Le Leilani, who was working ten hours for special collections and archives and then 10 hours for for the Suriso Academy. So it's it's not like there it's not like there were no archivists prior to a year and a half ago. Um, but what had been missing was a systematic uh, process that a university archivist creates by virtue of her or his position at an academic institution. 
And it, because we have not had that, there are huge, huge gaps in our archives. We, it's, it's large, as one might think it is, but there are huge gaps. Uh, just as one random example, we have um, very little on the athletic department's history of SJSU, which, uh, which currently knows well from <laughs> dealing with a disbelieving patron <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Um, we do not as yet have a lot of records compared to what, what I have seen at other university archives that in, in repositories that I have worked at in the past. Um, so, so there were a lot of gaps. And so that was another way to justify a need to have a full-time dedicated university archivist. And in fact, when I interviewed for this position way back in uh, August of 2017, and when I sat down with our, our dean at the time, she asked me during, during our our one-on-one -on -one interview if I that it, if I could create a new position, if I got the director job, and if I could create a new position what position would I create? And without hesitation, I said a university archivist. And so after I started uh, almost, almost in November of 2017, um, I, I pretty much hit the ground running relatively quickly in proposing this position in uh, early spring. I think around February was when uh, the dean asked me to start drafting a proposal for a university archivist position. The model that I used was from my experience at Kent State University in Northeast Ohio. That was my very first full-time job in this profession from 2004 to 2010. And the first three years I was there, we did not have a university archivist. So that was a case uh, just like here at SJSU of creating a new position. And it was justified for a lot of the same reasons. Kent State, like San Jose State, began as a normal school. And uh, San Jose State is older by probably close to about 45 or 50 years. But the roots of it were in, were in a normal school. Um, and again, there had been no uh, uh, systematic collecting. There had been sort of, it, it had been kind of a patchwork, random collecting. Uh, we'd hear a knock at the reading room door. We'd open the door. Nobody would be there, but there'd be like 20 boxes <laughs> laying there. So we, there was a need to get a university archivist there. And I used that model to, uh, to help justify my proposal here. And the, the whole, the, the key, I should say, central tenet of my proposal was the need for a campus-wide records management program. Um, I, I originally, when Carly and I were going through our slides yesterday, I had a slide of that kind of showed the records retention schedule and all of that. I, I, I took that out because I thought it was kind of getting a little too far down into the weeds. But suffice to say, although there is there, there is a, a records retention program at SJSU um, and there are records retention schedules, there, there's no, again, um, in terms of the life cycle of records, there, there are a few key gaps, one of them being the eventual transfer of records with archival value to the university archives. And it's also important to have a university archivist as the center of gravity in that kind of program and to go around and, and essentially inform and educate uh, key departments and individuals or stakeholders in various academic and administrative departments around a campus like SJSU, a fairly large, complex organism. Um, so that's really, uh, that, that was really the underlying number one reason to, to justify this position. As far as job descriptions go, um, in case anyone's wondering who actually writes a job description, and again, you know, I'm only 
when Carly and I are doing this, we're only kind of talking about our own our own personal experience here. So I'm sure other places are are different. But I I want you all to know that you really can't understate the the uh, prominence of university personnel or human resources in any kind of job description. So they're the ones that that have to le make sure that legally everything is uh, everything is written accurately and correctly, and that the process is going well too. Uh, so, but I will say that even though they had a hand in the job description and the dean did as well, I was given a, a lot of freedom to write much of the description. So even though, even though like we, we've all seen this, this kind of top level in some ways boilerplate uh, text on top of any, any job description. So I did not write this. There's already basically kind of a template in place. I think the only part I had a hand in was the university archivist reports to the director of special collections and archives and is responsible for developing and maintaining the archives of the oldest public university campus in California. So I didn't really have much of a hand other than that part and a lot of this, and this is only one paragraph of, of I think two or three paragraphs, but I did have a lot of say in determining the responsibilities. When, when you don't have when you haven't had a dedicated university archivist, um, there, there is the advantage of um, administrators who are going to depend on you, depend on somebody who has had experience in the profession on what it is that you need. So it, it was very, it was very uh, reassuring and gratifying to have administrators who were asking me what I needed instead of just telling me what the, what they thought I needed. So, and and what we needed, of course, just in these, as you can see, was uh, the identifying, selecting, and acquisition of archival collections, collaborating with records creators, and uh, then just kind of going down the list. You can see all of the different key job responsibilities. And the responsibilities are important because as we'll see later, they're, they are what the search committee uses as the baseline requirements for the job when we're going through applications. They're also uh, going to be the baseline for how one is evaluated when, when one gets the job in many ways too. So as you can see, in addition to just kind of the key records management priorities, there was also, um, there's also mention of instruction and reference and scholarship because it's a tenure track position, participating in the li library liaison program as well, which Carly does, and then uh, a diversity statement. I think the, if we, this was two years ago, if it were today, I think the diversity statement would even be more emphasized as I think a lot of job, um, I haven't been on a committee in, in a year and a half, but I think the diversity statements have been emphasized even more now than they have. And then the required qualifications. So, you know, the master's degree and formal coursework and demonstrated knowledge of, of trends and, um, and all of these things. Some of these are specific and a lot of them are kind of broad, you know, excellent project management skills and interpersonal skills and so forth. Um, I want you all to know too, there is a key difference between required qualifications and preferred qualifications. So to kind of go back to the, to the required, um, I, I mentioned this because sometimes, sometimes students will apply on, on one hand, there's sometimes when you're on a search committee, you see, you see applications from, from people who they just clearly don't meet most of the required qualifications. Um, at the same time, I have also, I've also known individuals who, who 
don't apply for a job because they they think they don't meet the qualifications when they actually do. So I just want to say just to really, really look over those quickly and, and, and carefully and know the difference between your required qualifications and then the, the preferred. The preferred is just kind of the, the wish list. Um, so for example, on our committee, uh, one of my colleagues had, had originally assumed that we would put archival certification on the required qualifications because she was outside of the profession. And I, I had to tell her that I'm, I'm fine with that being a preferred qualification, but it's not really, it's not essential in the profession. Um, I'm a certified archivist, but I have worked for and I have known many archivists who are not certified who, who are excellent archivists. So I didn't want that to be, I didn't want that to, to be a required qualification and, and risk limiting the pool even more than, than, than perhaps um, it, it would have been otherwise. So uh, a lot of that is, is really crucial. And then for timelines, searches can take a very long time because number one, you're electing a committee and in this case, there's five library faculty. Uh, it goes to a vote through the all of the library faculty. Also applications are very lengthy and once you get the committee together, it takes a long time. Uh, I cannot understate how difficult it is, particularly being a chair, trying to arrange a meeting for five different individuals, plus phone and in-person candidates. Uh, trying to get all that together can take a while. And then, as I said before, with university personnel oversight, there are rules to follow. So it's it's a bureaucracy, and like like any bureaucracy, it it takes time to do. And I'm I'm showing you this because this was the original template that we had. Uh, for the search. And I'm showing it to you just so you can see, number one, exactly how many different uh, checkpoints a search like this has to go through from your approvals to the committee selection to application deadlines and on and on. This is also, I'm showing it to you because it was very, very ambitious. So, uh, as you can see, we were fine with the, I think the application deadline, I think that was, that was, Carly can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was pretty much right there um, because I think we got your, uh, we got your application a couple weeks later. Um, but then uh, we had hoped for the first day, the first day of employment. I, I, I knew this was very unlikely when, when I saw it, but it's good to be ambitious, just to try to push hard. Um, yeah, but the first day of employment, April 2nd, that was the, the ideal. I think that was pretty much when the job was, was offered to Carly or it was not, not far um, before or after that. So she started in late July. But this is just to show you again, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very lengthy process. And even though ours, ours was only about three or four months behind and that was, that was pretty good on the whole, that was a pretty speedy process. But when you're, when a committee is reviewing applications, we're again, just looking to meet baseline objectives. We're looking to see who meets the baselines. And then if there's a phone interview, that the whole uh, objective of the phone interviews is then to whittle down the field even more to select your top candidates to advance. And then the in-person interviews, what happens when that's over is the committee then meets to rank the candidates. So some of the key takeaways I'll, I'll leave you with before I turn it over to Carly is your, your cover letter and CV do not get you the job, or I should say they don't by themselves get you the job. What they do is they get you the interview. So I would suggest, I don't, I don't wanna turn this into cover letter and resume writing 101, but I would suggest with a cover letter, the objective is to ask for an interview because it is the interview ultimately that gets you the job. 
And also the recruitment committee, at least ours, does not hire the candidate. What we do is we make a recommendation through the rankings, one, two, three, or however many final candidates that you have. And then it goes to the dean and then the provost. Um, from my experience, and on any committees I've been on at San Jose State and previously, there's never been a case where, uh, where our recommendation was overturned. I have heard that happen, but, um, but I think most of the time they go with the committee's recommendation. And you know, some searches are successful and others are not. And I would just say, if, you know, if a person does not get a job, when, when I first interviewed, I didn't get a job. I, you know, I, I took it very personally and I, it's, hard, it's hard to take things objectively, right? But I would just say there are many, many factors in play. It doesn't mean that, that a candidate did poorly necessarily, or it doesn't mean that that committee didn't like you or that there was an internal candidate. There might be the case of an internal candidate, but when I applied at Kent State, uh, I was an external candidate and I did not know I was up against an internal candidate and I got that job. Had I known there was an internal candidate, I may not have even applied in the first place. So sometimes money can be taken away too. Uh, so there, there are many, many complicated reasons. So I'll, I'll defer to Carly in terms of how to how to approach all of that. Um, because ultimately our, our search was a success. And now that I've told you all the rules, Carly can tell you how she broke them. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, um, great It was a good segue, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, hi everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you all and uh, share kind of what I did that worked for me. Um, I was in a very different uh, situation. We, I was not in the middle of a pandemic for, for one. Um, we were doing in-person interviews and uh, you know, now so many interviews are happening remotely. So uh, you know, some of what I'm gonna say today will apply to your reality and um, I'll try to focus on the things that I think would apply to your reality, but some of it, some of it might not. Um, it's because things are changing rapidly. Um, but I also, I'll talk about the job search from the perspective of someone who not too long ago was, a uh, you know, on the verge of graduating. Uh, I was getting my MLIS and, um, you know, I was determined to get a job as soon as possible after graduating. So, um, the first thing that I thought I did right was to start early. Uh, many months before, possibly even the semester before, I knew I was going to be applying for positions. I was looking for the places that I could find job postings. So I was subscribing to listservs. Um, I was talking to other archivists who had jobs that I thought were interesting about and how how they, what their journey was to getting their jobs, what were the steps that they took. Um, and I, you know, I found out about sites like Archives Gig and other places where I could find jobs and also internships. Um, and whenever I would find a job that, you know, made me, you know, perk up my antenna and I would think like that's the kind of job that I want to have when I graduate, I would read through the required and preferred qualifications and just start noting, okay, what are the things that I think I'll have by the time I graduate? And what are the things that I'm going to need if I'm going to get that, that dream job at the end? And um, I actually had a huge Google doc um, with a list of, of like, this is what I have, this is what I need. Um, so that's, those are other, other you know, parts of the strategies is having an idea, a clear, a clear vision for the kind of job you want. You might not get your dream job, you know, uh, but having a, a goal in mind and knowing how your skills apply to that goal, uh, that helped me to strategize um, while I was still in school, choosing which classes I was going to take, 
uh, based on on the jobs I hope to have at the end. Uh, speaking to supervisors at my internships about projects I wanted to take on, again, based on, on skills I knew I wanted to develop in time for my job search. Um, and then once I was ready to start applying for jobs, I uh, created a spreadsheet that allowed me to uh, organize uh, the information that I was getting from the job postings. And what I do is look at you know, what's the job, where is it, um, and how good of a fit is it for my skills. And then I had another column about how good of a fit it was for my interests. And then I'd note the application deadline, which speaking of breaking rules, I managed to miss the SGSU application deadline, but I, I went for it anyway, and thank goodness I did. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a good idea to find and note the application deadline so you don't miss that. Um, and then what the application requires. Uh, some of them you need to have a research plan some of them, is, especially if it's a tenure track position, you'll likely need to submit some kind of a research plan. Some of them require a separate diversity statement. Uh, some of them require uh, a certain number of references. So it's good to have a note of those kinds of details. And then I used my spreadsheet to prioritize uh, what jobs I would be applying for. So if there were several jobs with a deadline that was fast approaching, I would prioritize the ones that I thought I was a good fit for and that were kind of closer to my vision for the kind of job I wanted. And maybe maybe there were other dream jobs that I knew I wasn't a good fit for. I wasn't gonna spend as much time applying for those if I, if I knew um, there were some deadlines coming up that related to jobs I was more, more likely to get. There are you know, many different ways to approach that, that prioritization, but that was how I, how I looked at it. And I had all of my information in one place. Um, and then I could keep track of when I had applied to jobs, when I heard back from jobs, how many people rejected me before I got uh, an act actual interviews, uh, those, that kind of information. And uh, once you're actually applying, it's really important. I'm sure you've heard this from other people and you'll probably hear it many more times. Really important to tailor your application materials to the position that you're applying for. The way that I did this was I created a master CV that just had every single thing on it that could, you know, could possibly ever be relevant to my job search. But then when it came to uh, getting that CV ready for a particular job application, I tried to be really cognizant about uh, making sure that all the information that I wanted the hiring committee to see was easy to, to find. So I would just delete from that master CV, I would delete extraneous bullet points about projects I'd done, um, extraneous positions that didn't directly relate to the position I was applying for, uh, because what I really wanted the uh, hiring committee to see was uh, a presentation of myself as, you know, here's, th these are the things that you said you wanted for this position, and here's all of the ways that I fulfill those, those qualifications so that there would be, you know, no question, no way of missing uh, that information is the idea. And then as I went through you know, writing CVs and cover letters that spoke directly to the job, to the a particular job I was applying for. I, of course, saved every single draft um, of those applications because as my job search went on, I then had kind of a, a body of, uh, I guess that was my good, good record keeping practices, a body of information to draw on. And there were, you know, CVs that I could reuse uh, for a similar for a similar job or um, whole paragraphs from cover letters that would apply to uh, to the the new job application. Uh, to prepare for interviews, a key thing that I did was to reread the job posting and try to put myself in the shoes of the interviewers and imagine. Well, you know, what kind of questions they might ask me. And for each point in the job description, in the required qualifications and the preferred qualifications, I 
took notes for myself about an anecdote from my own experience that would highlight my, my skills in that area. It was just so that I was ready uh, to, to tell a story that again, made it, made it clear about how my own experiences fit the position. Another key, key thing that I did was to prepare my job talk well in advance as part of the position uh, at San Jose State. I had to give a, I think it was 20, 25 minute talk about my vision for the records management program. And I had that talk, I had the first draft of that talk ready I believe a week in advance. It was, I had it ready. I didn't have as much time to prepare it as I would have liked to because after the phone interview, the invitation to come to campus, there was a very short time frame. Um, but I believe it, I had it done a week in advance and I presented it to some of the archivists I'd been interning with. And that, you know, gave me a good chance to practice in front of a live audience. It also gave me a good chance to get feedback. But what's key to getting feedback is you have to have enough time to incorporate it. So if you're practicing in front of a live audience the day before your presentation and you get a lot of feedback, that it's not a good idea to change your presentation the day, you know, the day before you give it, especially if it's substantial feedback. In my case, it was hugely substantial feedback. They, um, the, the people who I presented to uh, talked about uh, how it was important that I tell more of my own and a personal story and interweave that throughout the presentation. I was very focused on the like, here's all the things I learned in school about archives. And they were, and you know, my, my practice audience was saying, that's good. Like put all that information in there, but relate it to kind of who you are and who you're going to be as an archivist and as a colleague. And um, it's more than just that uh, that job talk is more than just a chance to show that I know what I'm talking about, but to really kind of demonstrate more about who I am. Um, uh, they also, I mean, I had, I had, I had planned to kind of have my notes on note cards and they were like, don't throw, throw those note cards out, <laughs> you know, gave me some other uh, ways to, to use the, the tools on, uh, on PowerPoint to kind of keep my notes and be able to talk in a more smooth way and, and uh, connect more with, give more eye contact to the people I was talking to. So there were lots of, there was, that's just a little bit of it, but it was a completely different and a much better presentation by the time I'd incorporated that feedback. And if I'd done my practice a day, even two days before I went to, to campus to give the talk, I would not, I would not have been ready and it wouldn't have been as good of a talk. So that is to say just as much time as possible um, that you can give yourself to practice, get feedback and incorporate that feedback. And then on the day of whether that's phone interview, remote interview, an in-person interview, you want to be, well, the phone interview isn't a full day, but uh, you wanna be ready to you know, exhibit your best, your best self. It's an opportunity again, not just to show your skills, but also who you're going to be in that, in that position, what, what uh, aspects of yourself you're bringing to that position. And it can be, exhausting. You're, you're on, you know, in that interview day, you're on all day. So thinking about everything from, you know, if you're in person, what shoes you're wearing, because you're probably going to be walking around campus. Um, in my case, I would worked really hard on my professional, having my professional wardrobe ready and forgotten to check the weather and it was raining. <laughs> I didn't have an umbrella. Craig very kindly shared his umbrella. Uh, things like that. Uh, just, just, uh, everything, you know, you think about everything you can do to be ready and maybe you forget something, but you're, you're wanting to be comfortable. Uh, you're wanting to have, if you're doing a remote interview, you know, maybe you need to have water within reach or, you know, thinking about whatever you're going to need to, to show your best self. And then after the interview, this is where the controversy arises. Craig and I talk very often about thank you notes. Um, so the the general advice is that after the interview, you write a thank a thank you note. And the idea of that thank you note isn't just to say you know thank you for interviewing me. I mean, it is to express the gratitude for the time because it did take time and energy to to you know create and that that interview day and spend that time with you and get to know you. But you also, it's also a chance for you to kind of reflect back something you heard that day or something you're excited about um, as far as working, as, as having that position. So you might say, oh, you know, it was, 
wonderful to hear about how the university is doing such and such or and, and you know that's that's work I would be very interested in participating in something something to that effect that shows that you weren't just there but you were really listening and thinking about uh, the that that position as a as a place that you might be one day and then um, my strategy for enduring the time between the interview and the result is just to completely forget that that job ever existed, convince yourself you didn't want it anyway, and just move on to, you know, you've got that spreadsheet, you open the spreadsheet again, and you just move on to what's the next application. Uh, you don't want to get so hot up waiting to hear back about one job that you miss applying to other jobs. Um, and you also want to be prepared. I think it's much, for me, it's much better to prepare for a rejection and get a nice surprise than to be convinced that you're going to get the job and then get told, get told no. Uh, Craig already talked about uh, not, uh, not taking the no's personally. And I think that's really important. There's any number of factors that you can never know. Um, about why you might have gotten to know. One time I submitted, I spent so long, I was so sure I was the right person for this job. I spent so long on a cover letter and CV for this job. I submitted it at 10 o'clock at night and it came back with a no at like eight o'clock the next morning. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it, they had a computer. Some jobs do have computers reading applications and I probably just didn't have enough keywords to make it through to a real person, but it was, you know, it was devastating because I was so sure that I was going to get the job. So it's just better to just, you know, to be prepared to move on. I realized I talked about thank you notes and then I blew right past the controversy. So the controversy with thank you notes <laughs> is the question of whether to email a thank you note or to mail a thank you note. And I chose to put a thank you note in the mail. And the reason I chose that was because I had heard that some people find email thank you notes to be a kind of too flippant, too easy, and it's, and it's more meaningful to have something kind of tangible in your hands. Craig points out that this was a daring move because, <laughs> tell me if I'm misstating your, your, um, your take on it, Craig, because there was no guarantee that that thank you note was going to reach him or the committee before they had to make a decision and they could have been sitting there making a decision and I would have been the only candidate who they hadn't received a thank you note from. It worked out because the thank you note did reach Craig in time and it was you know, a very nice thank you note. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to think it, it was at least some uh, icing, icing on the cake as far as how I presented myself, but it could have gone horribly awry. And, you know, sometimes mail processing on the campus takes a while and it might not have reached them. So I leave that to, you know, to you to decide what, what approach is best for you. Um, so thank you for being here. And we are here to answer your questions. I saw there were some things popping up in chat already, but I didn't, I haven't read them yet. Let's see. See, oh, <laughs> I like the, the last question. I did. Well, so yeah, we'll start. So it was the thing. The th Carly's thank you note was embossed. I mean, it was, it was primo. So <laughs> I chose, I chose a very nice, I was very thoughtful about the card that I was choosing, especially I, it, so it was a card and I had in mind that, you know, these are like, at least Craig was an archivist. Not everyone on my committee was an archivist, <laughs> but, it, or I, no one else I should say on the committee was an archivist, but I knew at least Craig was an archivist and archivists appreciate nice paper. <laughs> so I had that in mind when I was choosing it. It was yeah. very well in terms of style and substance. It was a very good thing. You know, I, I say in, in, in every job I've applied for, and you know, and my searches are kind of like, Carly's experience and probably everyone else's too. I mean, I've been turned down multiple times um, for jobs. I, I have always I have always done it by email um, and usually just kind of like my my take is I send I send an email to either the the chair of the committee or the head of HR, whoever is library human resources or whoever's involved um, and just kind of express ju just a brief like paragraph just sort of expressing 
appreciation, like Carly said, it's it, it's both a genuine thank you, and it's also you know there's a it, it's also an opportunity for you to just remind them that you are interested in the position, um, and and that you exist. And you know, it's not it's not I've never been in a position where it's like the final deal breaker. This person didn't send a thank you, you know, but it's just rather. I think the best candidates. Um, oh, she sent it. She sent it to me. Uh, there was a follow-up question. That well, yeah, I think you did, but you also it was to me, but the committee as well was. It, I think it came to me personally, right? Yeah, Probably. I think I. Yeah. I think I addressed it to you, but maybe conveyed, you know, to the committee. Me. Yeah, right. So you can in an email also you can you I would say do the same thing. You, you know, send it to the yeah. person. I, I've seen, I've had, um, there was one candidate once for a, a position at another institution who sent like individual emails to every single person. It was a, it was a bit of overkill, I thought. Um, but to me, it's just kind of the, it's just sort of the, the cherry on top for a good Job. I would say somebody asked if it'd be overkill. I, I would say pick pick one or the other. Um, just bear in mind, you know, that that's kind of a key thing too, is when you have your interview, you should probably ask them where they are in the process. That's totally acceptable. If they say, if they say we're gonna make a decision soon, next week or whatever, mm-hmm. you, you might wanna think twice about having it go through, you know, snail mail. It's um, a good idea, Craig. But, but that's just my that's just my two cents. Yes, it was very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, there's uh, yeah, there sorry. are a couple. Sorry, thank you. The yeah. questions are coming. Yes, in. give us a second to read questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, there was oh. a question about the tone of the cover letters. Be- before um, we, before that one, somebody oh, asked, just because we were just on thank you notes, somebody asked mm-hmm. if it would be overkill to do, I'm assuming, they mm-hmm. said both. So I'm assuming they mean both email and, and snail mail. I was thinking mm-hmm. that could be the like resolution to like, you know, <laughs> I send an email, like I've just put a thank you card in the mail, but I wanted to express oh. over email mm-hmm. that, you know. Yeah, I think if you, I don't think that would be overkill. If you so choose. Yeah. If you want to be safe. Me, you gotta do you 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 gotta do you. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Do I that. think that I think that that process yeah. would work. Okay, what yeah. question were you gonna uh did you have any Carly this question from uh, Monica about um yeah, hard time about the tone of cover letters. Yeah, I have um, I have things yeah. to say about that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so my approach to cover letters. My voice and cover letters is basically, I know you're looking for someone to fill this position and I'm going to tell you all the reasons why I am the perfect person for this position. (laughs) When I sent my draft cover letters around to some friends, some of them came back and said that I needed to be more humble in my cover letters. And then I had a really interesting conversation with some, with some fellow job seekers about kind of gender dynamics in like, whether we think we can toot our own horns or not. Um, I eventually, I I ultimately went with my, here's why I think I'm perfect for this job uh, tone. Um, You know, I, I, I tend to open my cover letters with a paragraph about um, all the reasons why whatever institution I'm applying to is exactly the kind of institution I want to work for. So some, and I will like read an institution's mission statement to understand kind of what they're saying about themselves and then talk about how that reflects my own you know, values and professional goals and, and experiences. Um, and then I will choose a few key, key things from the uh, required or preferred qualifications and kind of tell a few stories about work that I've done that reflects that. And then kind of again, closing with, with my uh, enthusiasm and excitement for bringing my skills to kind of support the values and, and goals of the institution. That's, mm-hmm. that's my approach. It seems to have worked so far. Yeah, the, I would say, I would say the cover letter is really almost, it's, it's just as important as the CV. Um, and it's, it's a tricky skill to cultivate. It takes 
it took me kind of a long time to get the right tone. I, I would say in terms of length, um, I would suggest try to keep a cover letter no more than like a page and a half. Um, I've seen cover letters go on and on for like three, four or five pages. To me, that just kind of muddies the waters and it starts to look a little desperate. And remember too, your, your search committees are wading through a lot of applications. So, um, you know, even the best writers, if you're going on and on, um, it, it can be a bit much. Think of the cover letter as kind of like the coming attractions to a movie. You're sort of hitting, you're hitting the high points, okay? Um, and I would say, yeah, I mean, I've kind of, I personally just sort of hit on, as you said, it's a, it's, it's, it's tough. It's like, do you want to, you don't want to sound too arrogant. You don't want to sort of underplay. So it's sort of like the hashtag humble brag, <laughs> I think. Um, I, I just try to kind of hit a, the, this is what I've done. This is why the position interests me. Um, and, and obviously, you know, I, I have a temp, I, I should say I had a template for cover letters when I was applying for jobs. And then I would tailor that the cover letter to, you know, each particular job and position. I, I want to say Carly wrote, Carly wrote an excellent cover letter. It was, um, and you know, I, when I, when I was, proposing this position when in the buildup to, to convening the committee, I had in mind, again, I think I was focused on getting an archivist kind of like what we got at Kent State. So the person who we hired for that job had been an archivist at the University of Akron and before for probably almost 20 years. So we originally had in mind, I think somebody with a lot of experience, um, but I have to say, so, you know, when when I read Carly's cover letter, even though it was obviously early in the process, I was, I, and then, you know, others on the committee obviously were very impressed by it. Um, and even though this was a candidate, obviously, who did not have 20 years of experience, we thought it was somebody who who obviously had a lot of the, the skill set and the and and a lot of the other qualities, kind of key qualities that we were that we were looking for. So, yeah. What else? Well, that, it's actually related. There's a couple other questions that I think are related and a good kind of transition from that. One was about um, graduating without having internships, and the other mm. was about kind of ex uh, uh, talking about a career change, mm. um, and so. I think, I mean, well, I was able to, I'll say first, I was able to work out internships. I would not have been able to keep up the pace that I was working at uh, for longer than the year that I kept it up. But I did, you know, I had a full-time job that I was able to transition to a part-time job because I was able to get a paid internship. And um, I just, I was, sometimes I was three different places in one day and my budget was very tight, but yeah, I was making making it happen, um, but there are also um, I did work out some unpaid, uh, which is not ideal, but some unpaid remote uh, work just by bothering library and archive people and offering to do things for free, um, and uh, so that was one way that I was able to build build experience in in less than ideal circumstances. But I would also say both for a career change or, you know, graduating without the internships, looking at what are, what are your transferable skills just because you haven't worked in an archive. Like for example, um, I was, I was asked in my interview at San Jose state about my experience being a library liaison, which I have zero experience being a library or I had zero experience being a library liaison. Um, but what I did have was experience working, I'd worked in an admissions and development office in a school and that kind of process of reaching out to people, to various constituencies and understanding what their needs were from the department and going back to the department to kind of adjust based on those needs and uh, those kind of lines of communication is something that I was able to speak to that was uh, relatable to a library liaison job. Now I was, 
uh, transitioning from a career as I would had a, a over a decade of being an elementary school teacher before I started it started uh, library school and um yeah I don't know what what it looks like to look for these jobs not have an internship and also not have job experience uh behind you I, I can't I can't speak to that except to you know think about even your um volunteer experiences you know mm -hmm. Like think about how any experiences you've had. I used to work in retail. Retail work is totally relatable to your reference work, you know? So think about how things that you've done uh, yeah. can, can relate to what it means to be an archivist or librarian. Um, for the resume, I had a section that was, my, my, my CV has a section that is archives and library experience. And then another section that is other related experience. And that experience, that, that section includes my work as a teacher, though I didn't say everything that I did as a teacher. I talked about the things that I did as a teacher that were relatable to, as far as transferable skills to archives. Um, same with my work in admissions and development. Um, those, that was under the other related experience. So if you read my CV, it's not actually a solid timeline. It doesn't it, it, you know, exactly go in order because there's the archives and library section and then the other experience section. I hope that yeah. answered the questions. Yeah, and I would say too, following on the job experience. Yeah, it's really, for me, it's really crucial. Um, and again, I, I've seen I've seen CVs with, with GPAs on them. And I would yeah. say, take your GPA off. Yeah even if you got a 4.0 and all of that, it's always just kind of a, I've, I've just known a lot of, I've, I've just seen it sort of interpreted as kind of like a tell for lack of, lack of um, experience. I, I think the job experience is can often really weighted as more important. Um, you know, I'm making generalizations here, but I think that if you can get a job, I mean, I, I try a special collections and archives here in the South Bay. Um, you know, we have both, we have both uh, students who are in the iSchool, have been in the Mara program, and then students who have, um, or in the history program are kind of the two big ones. Um, but it, wh wh wherever you may be, I would say definitely try to get an internship. Um, you know, I got my master's, my MLIS at Kent State, but without ever actually setting foot on campus until after I started working there. So I did my internship at the Ohio State Archives, and I would not have been able to get a full-time job um, without that, that very crucial internship. And also at Marquette, when I, my last summer there after I graduated, after I got my first master's degree in history, I worked at the archive special collections there, not knowing what I was gonna do. So I really, I, I can't stress enough, you know, things have changed from when I was in school. I'm, I'm, I'm betraying my age, but just, um, you know, uh, all of my classes, none of my classes were online. So it was, except for a couple workshops. So all of mine were, I had the benefit of getting that kind of, um, in-person experience. So I would advise, and it, it's hard now with the pandemic, but um, if you can try to do so. I well, think this we're about out Pat. of time. Yeah. Yes, we are. This is Pat. Uh, and I wanted to say there was a question about the slides being available, but I wanted to tell everyone that within a week, uh, this entire presentation will be available on the um, on-demand webcast on the SJSU webinar site. So you'll be able to go through the entire presentation. I'm not sure about the slides themselves in PDF format, uh, if the speakers uh, feel that that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, we can give them to you if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then happy what to we share. could do is post them right near uh, your presentation information on that same website. So that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, both of you. You've yeah, it was fun. Lot to think about, uh, and I know <laughs> that our, our students are making notes. Someone privately sent me a note about how good this would be oh. for an interview prep kind of uh, a workshop for them. So uh, mm -hmm. I know they're getting a lot of value out of it. Thank you. Cool. Great. Thanks, everyone. It was great. Yeah.